by saying my name is Keith. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at 242. And if this is your very first time here, I want to welcome you to 242. But I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us via video in Saginaw and Livonia. We're really glad that you guys came to church today as we are continuing this series that we've been in called Made for More. Now we're going to get to that in a moment, but let me just start off by saying last weekend we had a pretty incredible event across all of our seven campuses that I think is worth mentioning and worth celebrating. Last week, we had something called Team Tailgate. How many of you were here for Team Tailgate last weekend? It was awesome. You know, what we did is on all of our campuses, most people dressed up in their favorite football team's jersey. And not only that, but we had fun and activities for the kids. But here is the exciting part of that, is last weekend, the purpose of doing that was not so that we could celebrate our favorite football team, but it was so that we could give people an opportunity to get involved on a serving team. And here's something that's worth celebrating. Last week, we had close to 400 people across all of our campuses say, I'm getting in the game. I'm going to get on the team. So let's celebrate that. Now, here's why that's worth celebrating. We're in a series called Made for More, which is all about living life for a bigger mission, living life for something that has meaning. And what many of those people last week said is, I want to live for a big mission. I want to live my life for purpose. Bob Buford once said this in his book, Halftime. He said that for most people, for the first 40 years of their life, they live for success. And what success means for most of us is this is what I do for myself. Making more money, getting a bigger house, getting a bigger boat. You fill in the blank. But then there's a change that happens. When most people hit that 40 mark, they realize that, you know, at the half point of my life, And I've succeeded, but nobody will remember my success. So I'm going to start living for a significance. And that's when life has meaning. So a lot of people jumped in. Here's the other thing that I'm excited about when it comes to our team tailgate is that I've noticed that when people get involved, their language changes. They move from talking about, hey, I want to tell you about that church over there. You know, the one I go to, the big one, the one with the turf field and a tall, dark and handsome teaching pastor. (laughs) You know something? I want to invite you to my church because they move from being a spectator to being an owner. And I just want to say, if you call this church your church home, we would love for all of you to be a part of a team, not for what you can do for us, but for what God will do in your life. Now, with that being said, let's jump into the series that we've been in called Made for More. What we've been doing in this series is we've been walking through the book of Ephesians because in the book of Ephesians, the apostle Paul are going to, is going to answer two fundamental questions. The first question is this, who am I? At some point in all of our lives, we ask the question, who am I? Actually, I think we tend to ask this question over and over again because typically in major seasons of change and transition, we ask the question, who am I? I I would bet that there are some of you who are young married couples and you're wrestling with this question, who am I? Because you know who you were before you were single. You know who you were when you were a young married couple. But now that you're pregnant or you've had your first kid, you're asking yourself, who are we now as parents? A lot of parents start asking this question when they become empty nesters. Now their kids are moved out and and you've kind of dreamed about the moment when when you would have the opportunity to do whatever you want. But now you're kind of looking at the empty nest and you're saying, who am I now in this season of my life? A lot of teenagers tend to ask this question, especially when they get to that 18 mark, because you're kind of like one person with two bodies. Because you got this idea, on one hand, you're legally a teenager, but you're also an adult, and so you're asking this question, who am I now? Paul's going to answer this identity question, but he will also answer another question. And here's the second question, who am I called to be? See, the first question is an identity question. The second question is a destiny question. Like, where am I going in life? And let me just say this as a side note. I think a lot of people tend to ask the what question. What am I supposed to be doing right now? What am I supposed to be doing if I'm going to have a a long, healthy, 
relationship instead of asking a who question, because here's what happens when you get your who right, it gets really clear what you're supposed to be doing with your life. Because here's what's also true. At some point in all of our lives, we get to a point where we start wrestling with this thought. There's got to be more to life than this. There's just got to be more to life than going through the agony of the monotony. Some of you parents are wrestling with this because every week you do the same thing. You wake up, you go to work from nine to five, then you get your kids to travel football, travel baseball, and then you come home and you do it all over again. And you're just saying, there's got to be more to life than this. Some of you teenagers are probably wrestling with this. You're saying, there's got to be more to life than just being the homecoming queen, the homecoming king. I can remember when I was a teenager starting to wrestle with this. I grew up in a very conservative Christian family. But once I got to high school, what my friends told me is, Keith, if you're going to have fun, you need to put your faith on the back burner. So I started doing that. I started going to parties. I started hanging out with all the people who I was supposed to hang out with. And I had a lot of fun. But often at the end of the night, I would lay my head on my pillow at night and I would go, there's got to be more to life than this. There was this emptiness. And what people told me is if I did what everybody else was doing, I'd have more fun. What I actually found was more guilt, more shame, more stuff to work with. I think that's why author C.S. Lewis said it like this. He said, if I find within myself desires in which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. That I was made for more. But here's where the challenge comes in. Most of us get this sense, this restlessness in our heart, but it's often how we pursue more that actually leads to the consequences in our life. You know, a lot of guys, when they get to kind of my age and stage of life, they start getting bored with life. They get bored with the house, the car, the wife, and they start going through what's called a midlife crisis. Now, let me just pause there for a moment because... I had a real interesting experience. This is probably about three weeks ago. I was kicking off the series Made for More. I was at our Ann Arbor campus, and while I'm there, some of the staff and volunteers, they start trying to guess my age. Well, one person said, hey, Keith, you got to be the youngest teaching pastor here. And I thought to myself, you probably have not met Joel Fireball yet. (laughs) Joel still has a curfew, and his mom has to drop him off and pick him up. (laughs) After every sermon he gives around here, you know, I'm the youngest. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Well, you know, they kept on going. They kept on going. Well, finally, um, one person said, Keith, I think you're 25. Another person said, hey, I think you're 31. And I thought to myself, anytime people think you look about 15 years younger than what you actually are, that's a good day. Now, some of you don't look impressed, but I just want to say I'm really excited about that. It has nothing to do with my sermon, but I want to keep going. Here's the point I'm making. A lot of men, when they get to the stage and season of life, when they're kind of at that midpoint in their life, they start going through this crisis. And you guys have all seen the signs, right? They get a fast car. They start putting a bunch of product in their hair. God forbid they start wearing skinny jeans. And here's what happened. What they're trying to do is they're trying to go back to a season of life that they left because they feel like they missed something. So their goal to get more is to go backwards Instead of understanding the real meaning and purpose of life. See, that's why Paul is going to write this book, the book of Ephesians. Now, in chapter 3, where we are today, if you've got a Bible or a Bible app, I want to invite you to get to chapter 3. Because in chapter 3, here's what Paul is going to say. We were made for more love in our lives. More love. Essentially, what Paul is going to do in Ephesians chapter 3 is he's going to answer the question that Tina Turner posed in 1983 when she asked this question. What's love got to do with it. How many of you were around in 1983? All right. Now, some of you did raise your hand and you should have raised your hand because I know you were around in 1983 because you still got that 1983 hairstyle. But anyway, (laughs) Paul's going to answer this question because in all of our lives, we're longing for love. Some of us are trying to fall in love. Some of us are trying to rekindle love, but we all long for more love in our lives. Look how Paul's going to answer this question. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to start right there in verse 1. Because here's what Paul's going to say. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace, which was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I've already written briefly. 
In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy prophets and apostles. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So here's what Paul's going to start off by saying. I want to tell you about a mystery. Now, I would imagine as people are reading this, they're just, he's going to talk about a mystery. Everybody's interested in mysteries, and he says, here's the mystery. The mystery is that God's always been in love with the whole world. See, in the Old Testament, we see the story of God's relationship with the Jewish people, but that was only a foundation of what was to come. And that's why it has been said that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Because what God was doing is he was setting up this relationship with this nation to say, this is not the only nation I want to deal with, but it's the foundation of how I want to deal with the world. So what Paul says, here's the mystery. The mystery is that God's plan was never meant to just be monocultural, but multicultural. God always had you in mind. He always wanted to have a relationship with you. And now I'm sharing with you the mystery. But Paul, as he writes this book, he's very positive. In chapter 1, verse 3, he's going to talk about how we're blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. He talks about who we used to be and who we are now. So you would assume that Paul's in a good place. But he starts off by saying, I'm a prisoner for Christ. A prisoner. He's in prison when he writes this. And here's the point that I think he's trying to help us to see is when you understand the love of God, the love of God will transcend your location. He's in prison. Now, for most of us, when we think of prison, we don't think about prison the way Paul would have thought about prison because where he probably was, he's in Rome, he's in the Mamertine prison, he's in the underground dungeon. And this underground dungeon is dark and it's filled with these federal criminals. You imagine something like Guantanamo Bay. Paul is in that place. But Paul says, I'm not worried about it because I know that God loves me. Here's what God's love does for you. It gives you hope in the midst of difficulty. Some people think this. If God loves me, he should never let me walk through anything painful. If God loves me, he should never let anybody that I love get an illness But on this side of eternity, we will deal with challenges. But here's what the love of God does. It gives us hope in the middle of that. Because the end is not the end. So Paul is sitting in prison. There's all types of reasons for him to be uncertain. But he says, I'm going to have hope in the middle of this because I know that God loves me. And I actually am made for more. You can put me in prison, but I got a message that's bigger than where I'm at. And I'm going to get that message out that God loves the entire world. I might be in prison, but the message is not held back. Now, when I was thinking about that this week, I thought about another historical character from history by the name of John Bunyan. John Bunyan found himself in prison in England in the 17th century. And Bunyan was this powerful leader who was in prison for the same thing for Paul, as Paul for preaching the gospel. But while he was in prison, he wrote a allegory of the Christian life called Pilgrim's Progress, And if you went to a Christian college, there's a chance that you studied it. It is the greatest literary work written in the English language. It's been translated into over 200 languages because Bunyan got the same thing as Paul. That, hey, God's love transcends my location. So Paul is talking about God's love here and the effect in his life. But then in verses 14 through 19, Paul's going to make a transition He's going to move from teaching to praying. And so here's what he says in verse 14 through, we're going to go to about 21. Paul says this in verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Paul says, let me tell you about the God in heaven. He's a father. And you might get your name from your earthly father, but where you really originate from is your father in heaven. Then he goes on to say this, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. 
Paul says, here's what I'm praying for you. Pastor Paul, if Paul was your pastor, Paul would say, here's what I'm praying for you. I want you to have a good job. I want you to be successful. I I want your family to be blessed. But here's what I'm really praying for you. I'm praying that you would be rooted in love. Because everything else you choose to be rooted in is unreliable. If you choose to be rooted in your personality and your good looks, at some point that will fail you. If you choose to be rooted in your riches and your money and your influence, at some point that will fail you. What's love got to do with it? It brings stability in your life. God's love makes you foundational and it gives you depth in who you are in life. For some of you right now, one of the reasons you feel unstable and uncertain is because you've rooted yourself in something besides God's love. So that thing that you used to depend on, that thing that you used to look to to give you a sense of meaning and worth, it's not giving you the same results. And Paul says, that's why you need to be rooted in God's love. Paul says, this is my prayer for you, that you be rooted in God's love and that you may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Paul says, you've never experienced this kind of love on this side of eternity. It surpasses everything you can think about, God's love. Then he goes on to say, that you may be filled with the, to the measure of the fullness of God. And then he ends, verse 20, 21, by giving us those famous verses. This is the end of Paul's prayer. He says, now unto him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work in us. To him be glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. If you want a good prayer to pray, this would be a great prayer to pray, that you would be rooted, that you would be established in God's love. Because when you get it, it changes everything. Now, in these verses, Paul's going to say, here's what I'm hoping that you would get, is that you would get the, the breadth, the width, the height, and the depth of God's love. So first, let's talk about the width of God's love. When Paul talks about the width of God's love, he's talking about his forgiveness, God's forgiveness. Look at how the psalmist will write about this in Psalms chapter 103, and we're going to start in verse 8. The psalmist says that the Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in love. Pause there for a moment. This changes your view of God. You've always heard about how God is angry But here's what the psalmist says. Here's what scripture says about God. That he's compassionate. Does he get angry? Yes. Does he get angry about sin? Yes. But here's why God gets angry about sin. Because he knows what it can do to you. He, he, He knows that sin will lie to you and rob you of your destiny. So God gets angry, but he's not angry necessarily at you. He's angry at the sin and Satan and how he uses it in your life. But he's slow to anger. It's kind of like what Paul is saying is God's not like that alcoholic stepfather that you had who just would get angry and snap on you. He's slow to anger. Then he goes on to say, he will not accuse or always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. God's not like your ex who just holds things against you, who, who keeps bringing up your past, keep bringing up your past. He says, nor does he treat us as our sins deserve. Or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And then here's the big verse. Some of you, you want a theme verse for your life? Verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us. The width of God's love is his forgiveness. See, earlier this year, I got an experience of the difference and the distinction between the east and the west. So in January, I flew to San Diego for this training. And when I flew to San Diego, at the time here in Michigan, some of you remember when we were in that polar vortex, it was seven degrees when I left. I got off the plane in San Diego, and it was 70 degrees when I landed. It was at that point that I repented of my sin and I said, Lord, I am so sorry for leaving this paradise to move to Michigan. (laughs) And I got to tell you, 
The difference was astonishing. I took off my overcoat and I thought, wow, this is beautiful. Here's why I tell you that. I think there's some of you who God has removed your sins as far as the east is from the west, but because you don't know this, you are living in a polar vortex of guilt and shame instead of in the sunny and 70 degrees of God's grace and forgiveness. See, here's what I think for most of us. We don't have a theological problem believing that God forgives us. For a lot of you, you have a problem forgiving yourself because you still carry that shame, that condemnation for the affair, for disappointing your children, for disappointing yourself, for not being the man or the woman that you committed to be. But listen, the width of God's love, as far as the east is from the west, God has removed your sins. When you understand that you're forgiven, it causes you to live in confidence. But let me take that one more step. It also causes you to forgive others. Because if God could forgive you for the stuff that you've not told anybody about, for the, for the stuff that has messed you up, if God for, could forgive you, the truth is forgiving people forgive other people. But this is why the evil one doesn't want you to understand the width of God's love. Because if you understood that you would live in freedom, you would live in peace, you would live in confidence, you wouldn't live chained to unforgiveness and brokenness. And so God's love is this wide, for, but for most of us, our love is about this wide. Paul says, I want you to understand the width of God's love. But then secondly, he says, here's what I also want you to understand, is the height of God's love. Now he's talking about God's presence. Look at this in Psalms 139, how the psalmist will describe the height of God's love. In Psalm chapter 139, the psalmist writes this, verse, starting at verse seven, he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, you will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Here's what... What Paul's talking about when he's talking about the height of God's love, he's talking about the inescapable abiding presence of God. What Paul's saying, if you're a follower of Christ, you can't get away from the presence of God even if you wanted to. Why could Paul write while he's in prison, while he's in chains, while he's facing death row about God's love? Because he understood that God's presence was right there with him. God's presence doesn't remove pain, but it gives you hope and it gives you strength in the middle of pain. You know, I've told this story before, but I'll never forget a season in my life where I felt like everything was falling apart. My dad had gotten diagnosed with prostate cancer. Me and my wife, we were trying to plant this church in Dallas-Fort Worth. It was extremely unsuccessful. And every part of my life up until that point, I had been generally pretty successful. Now, I don't say that to brag, but I'm talking about like most of us kind of have this kind of up and down journey as we kind of go up to success. That was me. And we get to this church plant and it was all this. Couldn't get people to come. I remember in that two-year period that we were in Dallas-Fort Worth, we had one family get baptized. Now, every person who makes a decision for Jesus is worth celebrating. But the church that I was a part of before, we used to have a hundred River baptism, we were, you know, right along this river, the St. Joe River, we call our church Riverside Church. We used to have 100 river baptisms just in one day. And I can remember feeling pretty hopeless. Also, during that time, I was doing a lot of fundraising to try to support this church because the church wasn't financially sustainable. And I can remember I'm doing sales and I'm preaching at churches, trying to sustain this season. I just kind of felt alone. And some of you have heard me tell this. I remember I'm getting ready to speak at this church. And I'm prepping and I'm getting ready to speak. And I just got honest with God. I said, God, I'm about to get in front of people. Talk about how you're good and faithful. But I don't even believe that right now. How can I with any kind of authenticity talk about that you're good where I feel like you're only allowing bad to come into my life? And I'll never forget just hearing the whisper of God. I wasn't even reading my Bible. I had my notes that I was preparing. But I'll never forget Psalms chapter 23 verse 4 coming into my heart. When I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. 
You've probably heard that if you grew up in church. Even though I walk through the valley in shadow of death, I will fear no evil. In the Hebrew, that can be translated when I walk through the darkest valley. I don't have to fear because you're with me. And I can remember nothing in my life changed. I didn't get any kind of miraculous check in the mail. My circumstances were still hard. But what happened in the midst of that moment is God's love, the height of God's love just gave me hope that if God was going to be with me, I was going to be okay. I came to tell somebody today that God being with you means you're going to be okay. Pastor, does that mean that everything is going to happen and, and my husband is going to repent and we're not going to get divorced? I, I didn't say that. What I, what I said is God's with you and you're going to be okay. Does that mean that my teenager is going to automatically, tomorrow they're going to start acting right and everything? No, no, no. That's not what I said. I said God's with you, so you're going to be okay. God's inescapable, abiding presence. When I was in my 20s, I did a lot of things I probably shouldn't do. But one of the things that I did, because I didn't know any better, is I went skydiving. And I can remember going up in this plane, getting ready to go skydiving. It was super kind of fun. But the first time you go skydiving, any of you have ever done it, know that you have, you have to do a tandem jump, which means that there's somebody tied to your back. So what that means is that if you don't pull the cord, he will. And I think this is the same principle here. The height of God's presence is if you don't pull the cord, God will. He'll be there with you. He'll give you the hope. When I was thinking about this particular point, I was reminded of that poem about the footprints in the sand. Some of you remember that. Some of you have that in your bathroom wall. About the two footprints. That, that I saw these two footprints, and then all of a sudden, two footprints became one set of footprints. And then in that moment, God spoke and said, hey, the two footprints, when they became one, was you didn't have the strength to keep going, so I carried you. For some of you, what you need to do is you need to relax in this season and just let God carry you. I can also remember during that period of time in my life where I was feeling so overwhelmed, I'll never forget crying out to God and says, I can't control this. And I just felt like God whispered in my heart, you don't have to. You're going to be okay. Here's the final thing that he's going to point out is he's going to talk about the depth of God's love. Now, I won't have you turn to it, but in John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus is going to make the statement. He's with his disciples, who he now calls his friends. They move from just disciples, people who sit at his feet. A disciple in the New Testament would literally sit at their teacher's feet to, in chapter 13, Jesus is going to do the most radical never been done before is as a rabbi, he's going to wash their feet. In washing their feet, what Jesus is going to prove is that the relationship has changed. And he's going to say, you're no longer just my servant. You're my friend. But here's what he's going to say in John chapter 15, verse 13. He says, greater love had no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. He says, there's a lot of love in this world. But the greatest expression of love is that I'm going to lay down my life for you. If you ever wanted to know how much God loves you, look at the cross. Jesus lived the perfect life. Now, I don't think any of us would say that you've lived the perfect life. But that perfect life, Jesus, says, I'm going to exchange that for your broken life. The depth of my love, that is my sacrifice. So can you see why Paul is praying this for the church in Ephesus? Because he's trying to challenge them not to pursue the mirage of more. They live in a city where they have all kind of financial wealth. city of Ephesus had over 250,000 people. They had all kind of entertainment options. They had a, they had a theater that seated 25,000 people. But here's what they were really known for is the Temple of Diana, where they would go worship there. But what the people did there couldn't be called worship. It was dark and disgusting. Paul well, says, don't chase that. Don't chase the mirage of more, because that leaves you empty on the inside. But experience God's fullness. Because here's what Paul says. If you get this, if you understand how much God loves you, number one, you're going to experience the fullness of God. But the reason some of you are not experiencing the fullness of God is not that it's not accessible. It's because you don't know it's available to you. You know, some of you have heard me give this analogy before, but I heard one time this fictional analogy of 
this couple who wins a free cruise. They, you know, are playing this, you know, uh, thing with the cap. You know, you go buy a Sprite and under the cap it says you win a free cruise. What we'll just call this man, Mr. Jones. He calls the company and says, hey, I don't know if this is a trick or not, but you said that I want a free cruise. If this is real, I want it to redeem it. The person says to Mr. Jones, yes, this is true. You want a free cruise. He goes on the cruise, but then he makes up his mind. Here's what I'm going to do. Because I don't have the money for all the other amenities, what I'm going to do is me and my wife, we're just going to sit in our room and eat cheese and crackers because we can't afford all the stuff. So day one goes by, they see people enjoying all the experiences around them, eating cheese and crackers. Day two, day three, day four, day five. Then on day six, one of the stewardess comes up to him and says, hey, Mr. Jones, I noticed that you and Ms. Jones, you haven't enjoyed all the stuff that we have to offer. And at that point, he puts his head down and says, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I couldn't afford all the other stuff that is available to me. And at that point, she says, can I see your ticket, Mr. Jones? She looks at his ticket and she says, sir, did you see that this is an all expense paid cruise? You're not experiencing what you could experience because you didn't know it was available to you. Here's the last thing that Paul's going to say. He says, when you understand how much God loves you, not only will you live in the fullness of God, but you will live unstoppable. He says, now unto him who can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can imagine or think according to his power at work in you. The power is working in you. And when you understand that the unstoppable God is living on in the inside of you, then you will live unstoppable. Now, when I think about that, I think about Pastor Norin in Nicaragua. A couple weeks ago, I was in Nicaragua. Here's a picture of Pastor Norin. Pastor Norin was telling us the story about why he chose to build this church in this remote, very poor place. And he said, here's what happened. He said, me and my church, we were fasting and praying. And while we're fasting and praying, I took a trip to this area that's poor and destitute. And while I was there, I thought to myself, we as a church, we're fasting and praying. We're choosing not to eat. And some of these people don't have a choice if they're going to eat. He said, that was the day I said, I'm going to do something about this. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the opportunity. I just knew that I had to do something about it. And when he decided to live unstoppable, he then got open the doors. He partnered with Compassion, which Compassion partnered with us. We were able to build this church. And I want to tell you, this church is in part because of us, but it's mostly because there was a leader who chose to be unstoppable. As I bring this to a close, I want to ask you, what's stopping you right now? What's stopping you from living the calling, from being the made for more person you're called to be? What excuse, what addiction, what weakness? If you understand the love of God, now unto him who can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can imagine or think according to his power at work. That's when you understand the power of God's love, it will set you free from those obstacles and you will be able to make a difference in this world.